So what this is really all about is adapting to changing context in our country and in our world. It's about thinking about how do we move beyond the traditional models of how we've worked in the past. It's about expanding our capacity for impact, the ability to reach more young people in new and dynamic ways. And always remembering that we've got to put learning right at the heart of all that we do. Welcome to another session on creating effective learning resources. And in this session, we're going to be looking at visual tips and tricks and how we can use design to really aid learning. Before we crack on with learning, here's a few things that you need to do. Make sure you get a drink down here so you're ready to learn. You're going to need that worksheet again and pen and maybe some paper as well. And this one's a little bit different. We want you to select any magazine. So just go for any magazine. It doesn't matter what the topic is because you're only been looking at the design, not the content they're in. And above all else, I want you ready to learn. So please set aside uh, your social media, close all the different tabs on your computer and let's jump right in. Let's take a quick look at what we've learned so far and what we're going to look at in this session. So we've covered the basics of remote learning. We've also looked at how we structure our learning resources. And in this session, we're going to focus in on how we can use visual design to really aid learning and help make learning stick. First, we'll look at why visual design actually matters. Is it more than just making stuff look pretty? We'll go into the language of design and look at the building blocks. And once you've got it, you can use it and it works every single time. Then we'll look at learning with images, learning with color and learning with fonts. All of these things together will make up the language of how we're going to actually engage students through visual learning aids. Last, we'll finish by just touching on the basics of copyright so that you know if you're using other people's stuff, how you can actually put it into practice in your lessons. What's brilliant about using design to really aid your learning is once you've got the basics right, and once you develop a consistent approach in your work, it actually saves you time and it works every time. So for the busy practitioner who's looking for creating resources in as quick a way as possible, you master a few of these basics and it's really going to help you skyrocket your students learning. But why bother? Isn't it just about making stuff look pretty? Is there more than just packaging? Isn't it about what's on the inside that counts? Well, of course, right at the core of learning resources, we've got to make sure that the content works. But actually presenting that in a visual way can really aid our learning. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this session. Good visual design can help students engage. It makes learning stick. We can simplify complex information quickly and it appeals to the visual world of teenagers makes it more accessible for all types of learners and it instantly adds a sense of value and worth to any learning resource. The first thing to realize when it comes to design is that nothing exists in a vacuum. Every color, every font, every image, every element of design is pre-programmed to speak something to the person that engages with it. So we've got to make sure that the design that we use is saying the right things to reach our audience. We've got to make sure if nothing exists in a vacuum that we're not giving out mixed messages and not unintentionally confusing the learner or actually preventing learning from sticking. And that's why design is so important. It can be quite helpful to think of design as a type of language. It's, it's a way of communication and there's building blocks that make up visual design. We don't need to go in depth massively into this, but most of you will instinctively know what looks good or bad. It's in us. We, we just can't always explain why. So when it comes to the building blocks of design, we need to think about the way that we lay out things on a page as a primary importance to our design. And the way we do this can really help learning. So think about the emphasis. What is it that you want to emphasize in that learning? Think about balance, arranging elements on a page to not cause confusion, to create a little sense of unity. Think about contrast. Think about rhythm, proportion, how big something is, how small something is. 
Think about variety, that if we're just doing the same thing in the same way, that's actually going to be boring our learners rather than engaging them. So using and understanding the building blocks of design, just as outlined here on the page by Anita Green, is a really simple way of starting to think about how we can actually structure our visual resources. And we'll look at that more as we go throughout this session. Design is basically the combination of all those different elements to make something look right and look good. So here's what I wanted to do. I'm going to do a 10 minute task. Uh, you'll pause the video in a minute, but I want you to take that magazine that you got at the start of the session and flick through it and look for what you think in your view is a good example of design. So something that really strikes or stands out to you, a really great piece of communication. And then on your worksheet, write down five reasons why you think that design is actually effective. And on the worksheet is a reminder of those building blocks of design. So you might actually use some of that wording as you complete this task. So if we imagine design as a recipe that combines images, colors, words, and layout in the right way, the first thing we've got to think about is using images. And images are such a great way of aiding and um, empowering the learner. They say that a picture paints a thousand words. So you can say something in an image that would take ages to try to explain in other ways. And one of the greatest ways that you can use high quality images is by using a royalty free website. I'll explain a bit more about what royalty free means later on, but two great places where you can get images for free and download them without having to do much uh, attribution to the original person is using Unsplash the website and Pexels. So Unsplash and Pexels, that's where all of the um, images have come from, from this learning resource. And you can just get such an array of high quality photos that can say what you want it to say in one image. We can use images in a great effective way that's really visually appealing, but you can also use them badly as well. So this is where we don't want to fall foul to any design gremlins here. So there's a couple of things to understand. First of all, you've got to understand what type of image it is that you're actually using. And there's generally two main types of file that we need to think about. There's a vector image and a raster image. I know it sounds a little bit scientific, but here's a simple explanation. A vector image is any image that you could blow up to the size of a house and it wouldn't change quality at all. So generally logos or any any sort of quality illustrations, they're made in a vector format and you can see some of the file formats there. A raster image is something that's digitized. It's made up of tiny little dots that actually make that image what it is. And the more you blow that up, the bigger those dots get. So basically it gets what we know as digitized. So you've got to think carefully what type of image you're using and have the resolution, so that is the quality of that image in the first place, be as high as possible. So if you do want to make it a little bit bigger, it's not going to get over digitized. You also want to think about not stretching that image out of its proportions. So our brains just naturally know what looks right and what doesn't. So you can see in this picture, the snowflake is just a little bit stretched versus it being perfect and um, actually proportionate to its proper size. And we notice these things subconsciously, even if we don't know it, uh, you know, in the obvious way. Final thing to say about images and just making sure we don't mess with the integrity of our files is where possible, if you are using logos, try to use a logo that has got a clear background. It's generally known as an EPS file. EPS file has got a transparent background. It just makes things look so much better on the page. As well as using photographs to speak a thousand words, isn't it brilliant that we can make the most of infographics? Infographics are amazing education tools and icons are brilliant too. So you can see in this image from Harley Therapy, this is just about healthy relationships. And just straight away, you've got a really clear view of what the facts are, what it's trying to communicate, really clear use of language and brilliant iconography to actually say something in one image. As with all great things in life, sometimes less is more. So when you are thinking about using images and laying out your page to try and get balance and unity, we need to actually almost think about white space as an image in itself. 
So you can get tremendous clarity by using white space in the right way. And it's just a brilliant way of actually drawing attention to the big thing that you want students to get a hold of. Thinking about white space brings us nicely on to the subject of colour. So as much as images speak to us, colour also speaks to us. And you don't have to worry about why it works. You've just got to know that the colour wheel and the positioning of colours on that colour wheel, it just works. So if you want to choose what colours go together, you can just look at a colour wheel like this. Just uh, look at the ones on the screen or just Google colour wheel. And you're going to know straight away the way that light combines to make great colour combinations. So you want to be thinking about colours that are on the opposite and complementary end of the scale. So here, as in this picture, you've got red orange goes really well with blue green and the different variations of it. You want to think about maybe using three different colours. They call it the triadic colour combination. But it basically is another way of saying these colours work really well together. So if you want to choose that colour selection for yourself, look at a colour wheel and you can see the different colour combinations that are going to work every single time. The analogous colour combination is basically where colours sit together on that colour wheel and how you can combine them together to make something work. So don't reinvent the colour wheel. If you want to know what colours work, these will work every single time. You might think that talking about colour was quite a simple thing, but actually everybody has a different understanding of what a colour is. So if I said to you, think about blue, what kind of blue are you thinking about? Is it a navy blue? Is it a royal blue? Is it a duck egg blue? Is it a light blue? Is it a sky blue? There's so many different endless variations when we start to think about colour. So what's happened over the years is there's a common language that's been developed to help us be able to get consistency when we're communicating about colour. And there's different codes that are used depending on what you're doing. So CMYK is used in the print industry. RGB is generally used for the screen and the web and uh, digital resources. Hex is a code that can be actually applied into any online resource. I'll come back to that one in a second. And Pantone is what they used to do when they physically would walk around with these swatches where if you wanted to choose a yellow or choose a blue somebody would come to you and say what kind of pink do you want today and they would literally show you this Pantone color guide to enable you to select the right swatch. I mentioned about hex. Hex is a six digit code which probably you should think about because if you want to get a pink in uh, PowerPoint and also pink in Microsoft Word or in any other design package what you want to do is learn what that hex code is because to get that exact pink in any package you're using what you normally do is go to the color section click it up just like you can see in the middle of the screen and at the bottom is that six digit hex code and if you know and find out that code you can guarantee you get the same color each and everywhere you use it it's a brilliant tip when you're actually designing across multiple packages And of course, the reason why getting our colour right is so important is because every colour communicates something different. So we can express moods or we can even change moods scientifically by using the right colour. So red is often a sign of passion, activity, it's exciting, it's bold, it's energetic. And you can see from this infographic here, great use of infographic, by the way, you can see this infographic where all the different brands which are trying to actually come in line with that colour. So they want you to think about their brand in a certain way and they use colour to communicate that. Same goes for pink and purple and navy, green, blue and orange. All of these things communicate different moods. So think about your learning. Think about when you're trying to help students grasp hold of a concept or trying to invoke an emotion or trying to make them think about something new. We can use colour very simply to help invoke not just a cognitive response but an emotive response as well. And if we can get hold of the emotion of the student they're much more likely to embed that learning. And the converse is also true that if you use colour in the wrong way you can accidentally be communicating the wrong thing. So you might want to communicate something quite serious and quite concrete, but actually using the wrong colour in the wrong way at the wrong time 
could actually confuse, distract or take away from learning. So simply grasping hold of uh, what different colours represent, what they mean and doing a bit of research into colour theory in your own time can really help you maximise your visual aid for learning. And just a quick tip to help you find the perfect match for any colour. If you are starting with a, a great image, so we've got an image of a rose here on the screen, and you want to actually match your colour scheme to that image, it's just a brilliant way to get great design every time. So to make that colour and image work together, you would just basically, if you're in PowerPoint, go to the eyedropper tool, which is in the colours, and you actually will hover over that rose and you can select any of the petals or any of the darker elements of it and get a colour that will work exactly the same on your PowerPoint. So this red background is exactly the same colour as the rose using the eyedropper. And it's just a really nice way of bringing balance and unity to an image. It keeps it crisp, it keeps it clean, and it helps students focus on the learning rather than being distracted. Let's just pause for a minute and go back to our magazine again. This time when you're looking through it, I want you to look for some great examples of colour use. What kind of message or mood do you think they're trying to say? Or what they're trying to communicate with the way that they use colour? You don't have to write anything down. You don't have to do anything else as a response to this. I just want you to take just two minutes to actually look at some great examples of colour use and think about what it means to you. And last but not least on the menu, we've talked about images, we've talked about colour. Now let's think about fonts as part of our layout. Of course, getting fonts right means that we're actually going to be able to read the words properly and get right to the heart of the message. And there's a few tricks that I'm, and hints that I'm just going to teach you just in quite quick fire, really, just to help you use fonts to aid your learning. But before we do that, think about two things. Number one, it's not particularly about fonts, it's more about words. Remember that spelling and grammar really matter. So make sure you always check your spelling when it comes to using words and make sure that you use grammar in as good a way as possible. We also need to think about compatibility. So if you are going to be exporting a um, learning resource into a different format or giving it in the format that it is, you need to think about the end user and are they going to have the same fonts as you? Otherwise, you could do something really beautiful, but if it's actually going to be uh, given to them straight as it is and they open it up on their system, it may come out totally wrong. So think about compatibility. So the first trick is to pair a serif font with a sans serif font to really improve communication. What do we mean by that? Well, a serif font and a sans serif font. Basically, the word serif means feet. So basically, if you look, most fonts either have little feet on them, just like you can see on the screen on the right hand side, or they don't. So the font that we're using uh, here in the heading is a sans serif. So it's without feet. And often in titles, it's brilliant to use a sans serif because it's just very bold. But then in the actual text, in different places, you will see using that serif font. And it's just a good way to get a different combination and help people understand what they should be concentrating on at different points. When we're laying out our words and using fonts, size really does matter. What people see first is what they consider is the most important thing. And unfortunately, on a lot of teaching PowerPoints, you see so much bad use of this, unfortunately, where people are trying to put loads on a page and you can't quite tell what is it that's the most important thing. What should I actually be concentrating on? So remember that the biggest thing on there is going to be the thing that that person's drawn to the most. We also need to think about how that resource is going to be used. If it's going to be viewed on a mobile phone or on a laptop, if the font is too small, you're simply not actually going to be able to read it. And of course, the greatest example of um, what we call typographic hierarchy in the industry, basically the order of fonts and text to communicate a message. We can see this in the newspaper. So you've got the big headline, you've got a subheading, and then you've got the text itself. It's really clear to know what should come first and what you need to read next. Do your PowerPoints communicate the same thing? 
we can use fonts in lots of other ways to actually communicate messages clearly and help people understand the hierarchy of importance so obviously making something bold versus making something regular makes a difference in what they draw attention to first if we want to avoid confusion one of the things that we can do with fonts is basically choose a way of using a font within a resource and stick to that way so don't go all over the place and they do say more often than not you shouldn't use more than three fonts So once you've sort of chosen how you want to use that font, you might want to look at trying to use slightly different fonts from the same family. It's a good way of getting a bit of variance. So here you've got railway black head and railway light head. And often when you look at the drop down list in the menu on your package, you can see different types of the same font. It's just a really great way of getting a bit of variance and getting some clarity over how you want to use that font within your own resource. If you are going to push the boat out a little bit and use a crazy font, maybe like for a heading or in a different way, make sure that you sort of contrast that. There's that design element again, contrast crazy with neutral and everything has to be readable. Otherwise, what's the point of using it? Just like colour is its own language, fonts also speak for themselves too. So because nothing exists in a vacuum, remember we said that at the start, we associate certain fonts and certain styles with other things in this world. So because we live in this world where there's so many different messages coming at us left, right and centre, we've got to be careful that there isn't a hidden message in our font choices that's actually going to distract the learner. So I love this uh, infographic here, I love this picture. How does your font taste? You know, so there's the difference between the messages of what's plain and neutral, something meaty and strong, sweet, salty and sour. It's quite a fun way of thinking about fonts, but it just reminds us again that even fonts can trigger a sensory response in our audience. There's a psychology behind type choices and we can see in the type of font that we use, whether or not it represents tradition, respectability, stability strength is it stylish is it friendly is it elegant is it creative and all of these choices help say those hidden messages to our learners when we're thinking about font usage so what we don't want to be doing is for example using a creative elegant font when we're trying to address a really serious issue we sometimes might want to veer it towards using the friendly because that will help engage the learners in the right way if the tone of the lesson lends itself that way. So you can use fonts to evoke emotion, to speak for themselves and to just give those subtle hidden messages. Just make sure you're using them to your advantage and they're not working against you. If you are at home or near any kitchen now um, hopefully you have permission to do this but just take a f uh, two minutes and pause the video and go off and look in your kitchen cupboards because in your kitchen cupboard it's full of loads of different packages that are using colors and images and fonts to try to communicate something to you when you chose them in the shop they were trying to speak something to you and communicate a message instantly without you even thinking about it and now they're on your shelf, they're still speaking to you. So go and have a look at them, take out a few bits of packaging and just think about what is this actually saying without saying a word. I'm quite proud of this image because I took this with my iPhone in my kitchen cupboard. And like your cupboard, my um, kitchen is just full of loads of different types of packaging and all of them are trying to say a message to me. So just let's use one example. On the right hand side, we've got mild salsa. It's using this combination of colors, fonts and images. And straight away, I'm thinking about Mexico, but it never actually says it's Mexican. So when it comes to combining colors, images and fonts together, we can really say something based on this world of uh, preconceived ideas out there. So what we want to do is avoid accidental hidden messages and really focus our learning with the way that we use visual design. You may have never really thought about this before, but there's so many rules, isn't there, to visual design. Like I said at the start, we just know what looks good. And sometimes it's the simple little decisions that we make that make 
all the difference when we're designing. But you got to love this quote from Pablo Picasso. He said, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. And there are sometimes times when it comes to design, when the thing that shouldn't work just works and the thing that you shouldn't do, you've got to do because it's the right thing to do to drive home the learning at that time. So what is this going to look like for you? Somebody once said that no idea is a new idea and basically everything has gone before. So what do we need to think about when it comes to using other people's copyrighted stuff, whether it's an image or um, some sort of idea when we're creating creative resources? Well, there's probably two things to think about, and it's that we can use copyrighted material. So copyright, basically, if somebody else creates something, they own the rights to that image or they own the rights to that idea, they own the rights to that resource. And we can at times use that for two main reasons. The first is for educational purposes. So you can copy works in any medium as long as it's to illustrate a point and it's not done for commercial purposes. So you're not trying to make loads of money out of it. And it's basically got an acknowledgement in so much as it's used for education. So you're trying to teach about a resource or try and reflect on an artist or look at a concept or a big idea. As long as what you're not trying to do is pass it off as your own, you're OK. And fair use is basically the use of any copyrighted material done for limited purposes, such as to comment upon it, criticize it, parody it, or um, create your own thing off the back of it. So fair use of copyright in this image infographic shows us is basically where you're not using the whole idea and passing it off of your own. So if you're looking at, say, a concept in relationships such as love languages, you can talk about love languages as long as you're not trying to say, I am the person that invented this concept. As long as you're referencing the person that invented it, it's fair use. You can also criticize a work. You can show examples of work because that's all in the realm of education. You should have a clear rationale for why you're using somebody's work and credit them where possible. You'll notice that all of the images that we're using in here from Unsplash or from Pexels, they credit the original origin. And sometimes the website itself will tell you what kind of credit they'd ideally like. So you can use that that way. Above all else, what we're thinking about is not using other people's material, claiming it as our own. But we can actually use information, images, even ideas for the purposes of education. Let's recap the main points of what we've been learning today then. We've been looking at how we use visual design to aid learning. Thinking about why visual design matters and actually if we use design in the right way it can really help learning to stick. We've thought about what the building blocks of visual design actually are. It's that recipe, that combination of how we lay out images, colours and fonts on a page and how in each of these elements we can use it to maximize learning. So a picture paints a thousand words. Color invokes an emotion and a mood that can really engage learners. And using fonts can help us, if we use them in the right way, to say what's really important and draw attention to, to what's key and what needs to come next. We've done all this in the concepts of understanding copyright and how basically if we're gonna use other people's stuff, we need to make sure we credit them or change it and make it our own. In the next lesson, we're going to look at how to make effective videos, and you'll definitely get to put some of these design ideas into practice. Well, that's been a whistle stop tour of using visual aid to really ramp up our learning. What do you do if you want to know more? Well, there's loads of uh, how to videos on YouTube when you're thinking about design, even just looking around you using magazines and uh, packaging just take some time now to think about what looks good and think about why it works i love canva because canva is a free piece of software which you can download as an app or you can use it online and canva helps you combine words images and colors in such brilliant ways if you want to find some great images for your work go on to pexels Com. And what not a lot of people know about Pexels is you can also use videos as well and they can download little short video clips which are quite good. You'll see some of those in the next session. And Unsplash, again, just a brilliant place for beautiful photography. 
to help that picture paint a thousand words. Last but not least, most people don't know, but Office has so many how to's or kind of frequently asked questions or things that you can learn if you want to know some of the mechanics and the technical side of doing what you need to do. It's a brilliant package for design and it's so much more than just about creating a simple document. When you get a chance, why not share your feedback about this session? So once again, get your smartphone out, turn on the camera, scan the QR code, go to the survey and give us your feedback from this session. And we'll see you next time.